So um, we're going to start our journey inward today. So we know about peripheral nerves now. Uh, now we're going to connect them to the, the body. Then we'll connect them to the spinal cord and the rest of the brain next week. So we'll talk about uh, the, the sensory and motor innervation in our, our skin, that'd be sensory, uh, except for the autonomic nervous system. Muscles, that should be near and dear to your heart, I hope. Uh, we'll go over how muscles work and how neurons control how muscles work. And the joints too, joints matter I think. Uh, the first big idea is going to be the, the motor unit, so muscle control. Uh, a motor unit is just a motor neuron and all the muscle fibers that it innervates. You have different size motor units, anywhere from uh, three or so muscle fibers in the eye to I don't know, a thousand or so in your larger uh, muscle groups. That's going to determine how fine of control you have. So you want to have very small movements of the eyes um, as opposed to your, your leg muscles. You want more powerful, larger movements there to move your entire body around, as opposed to this little eye that's just floating around. You don't need much power for that. Uh, we'll talk about the sensory component of muscles down here. Uh, and then we'll get into the skin and touch on the tactile and painful <coughs> sensations that we can get in our skin. Now when we are uh, controlling our muscles, we, we prefer to have smooth movements, no jerky movements here. And that's going to be aided by uh, Ohm's Law and the size principle. So we're coming back to that. V is still going to equal IR, and we'll see how that relates uh, to motor control here. But you want to recruit the weak fibers first and, and smoothly work your way up to the most powerful fibers. You don't want to start off at 10. <coughs> start off at 1 and work your way up. So first, just a bit on how muscles contract, so that we're all on the same page here, we understand what's going on, and we can appreciate why we need calcium influx. Why do we need nicotinic acetylcholine receptors? So the basic uh, building unit of your skeletal muscles is going to be this. Here's your sarcomere. Uh, I'm sure you're very familiar with these, so we're going to kind of breeze through this. You have thin filaments of actin. It's the same actin that we've talked about before. Um, and then you have thick filaments of myosin. Myosin is the motor protein that run, runs along actin. All these little, little dots here, these are the myosin ATPases, or the, uh, the part of it that actually hydrolyzes ATP to move. They're scattered all along here. Uh, it's not actually naked right here. That's just what it looks like in the cartoon. Uh, these filaments don't change size, they just slide along each other to shorten the overall length of the sarcomere. That's going to shorten the overall length of the muscle because the muscle is just made of a whole bunch of sarcomeres. These sarcomeres come together to form uh, bands of protein called myofibrils. Here's your myofibril. This is uh, one of the many myofibrils that we find in muscle fibers or myocytes, muscle cells. Don't let the name fool you. These aren't single cells, really, it's many cells that fuse their cytoplasm. So you'll find a bunch of different nuclei in each muscle cell. Because these things are huge, it couldn't be a single cell. So it's many cells fusing together to form a constituent. So here's our... A series of molecular events... Oh yeah, we're not, we're not going to have that. We're not going to have that. Hold on. I want my, my nasally voice uh, to narrate what's going on. So we got muscles. Yes, we're going to zoom in. There's a whole bunch of muscle fibers that make this up. Those muscle fibers, uh, there they are, are made of myofibrils. There they are, and there's the sarcomeres in short. So there it is. That's how we move. Little tiny pieces within the muscle shorten themselves, and so the muscle as a whole shortens. There's our myosin filaments. The actin filaments are yellow here. There's myosin swimming along actin, pulling it about 10 nanometers at a time to shorten the overall length of the sarcomere. These filaments don't change their overall shape. They just slide along each other. Sliding filaments. That's how we shorten the length of our sarcomere and thus our muscle. Now what's going on there when myosin is swimming along actin is the myosin power <coughs> structure. But we're spending one molecule of ATP 
to move 10 nanometers. So we're going to be burning quite a bit of ATP whenever we flex. Too bad I don't have my tank top. So here's, here's your, your simplified myosin power stroke. Myosin is an ATPase. What that means is that it will hydrolyze ATP. It's going to break ATP down to ADP. So it's going to remove a phosphate. We're going from triphosphate to diphosphate. And that's where we're going to start. We'll assume that myosin uh, is alive and well and it's hydrolyzed ATP. So now it's in its ADP bound form. In that form, it can interact stably with actin. That's what happens here. Myosin ADP, there's that little head that's going to swim along our thin filament, binds to actin. That's the thin filament on top. So we bind. When myosin binds to actin, that destabilizes its interaction with ADP. So it'll kick off that extra phosphate. That'll tighten up the interaction. And then it will release the ADP. So the adenosine diphosphate is removed. When it's removed, that changes the shape of myosin. It's no longer like this. Now it cocks back. Because it's interacting stably with actin, when it moves back, your actin filament moves back as well. So we're going to start pulling those thin filaments here. We're no longer bound to any adenosine molecules here. So now we have a free binding site available. If our muscle cell is alive and well, there will be plenty of ATP around. When ATP binds to myosin, that destabilizes the interaction with actin. So myosin lets go. It can only really bind one thing at a time. Think of it that way. We're either binding actin or we're binding adenosine. Can't be both. Once ATP binds, this is more stable than this interaction, so myosin falls off. Myosin is an ATPase. What does that mean? Hydrolyzes ATP. Fantastic. ATP gets hydrolyzed or broken down into ADP. And now, instead of being flexed, we cock forward again. And that's it. Now we're back at ADP. Myosin, well, now we can bind to actin again. When we do that, ADP falls off. We flex. ATP binds. We let go of actin. We burn it. We unflex. Repeat this over and over and over. And you'll see your sarcomeres shorten. So here it is in cartoon format. Make sure we get what's going on here. If we're going to bind to actin, what, what's bound to myosin right now? ATP or ADP? ADP. ADP. All right, there let go of the phosphate. That's just going to stabilize the interaction. We'll get a nice little flash of light, that's what that means. So we're holding on to actin tightly. When we hold on to actin tightly, we can't hold on to something else. We can only hold one thing. It's just one little globular head. And when we let go, we flex. Now we have an open binding site. ATP can come in and bind. Again, we can only hold on to one thing. So if we're holding on to ATP, we can't hold on to actin anymore. So we let go. Now, of course, there's a bunch of myosin heads here, and they're not all doing the exact same thing at the exact same time, so others are holding on. Our filaments don't slide. It's okay, in case you were worried about that. Myosin is an ATPase, so it breaks down ATP to form ADP, and we're back to our forward position. And there it is. That's how your muscles contract. Notice we haven't needed a neuron at any point yet. So we don't need those, right? Of course we do. It's not just actin to myosin. There are other proteins involved, of course. Uh, those those um, myosin binding sites on actin are normally hidden. This prevents myosin and actin from interacting and causing our muscles to contract unless we tell them to. Now, how do we tell them to? Well, we give them a little burst of calcium. We'll get to that at the end. Let's just assume we have calcium around. There's two proteins that we need to think about. Tropomyosin. Notice myosin's in there, but it's not myosin. This is a protein that gets in the way of the myosin binding site. It's this uh, sort of helix that's wrapping around our actin filament there. These, these dark filaments here. And that's connected uh, to a protein called troponin. Troponin is a calcium binding protein. 
when it binds calcium, it changes its shape. And it pulls tropomyosin out of the way. So when we have calcium floating around in the muscle cell, troponin is going to bind it, change its shape, pull tropomyosin out of the way, so now myosin and actin can interact. We expose these little blue myosin binding sites that are normally hidden whenever we have low intracellular calcium levels, which we do until we get input from nerves. Here that is in cartoon format. So now we have our green uh, tropomyosin filaments wrapping around, hiding those uh, myosin binding sites. There's troponin. When we have calcium influx, troponin is going to bind calcium and change its shape. And when it does that, you'll see it pulls tropomyosin out of the way. Now we have myosin binding sites exposed. So myosin is flopping around there. It's not really sitting still. It's always flopping, kind of like the inactivation gate of voltage-gated sodium channels. But it doesn't have anything to stick to until we move tropomyosin out of the way. Then it can bind, and we're off to the races. Myosin power strokes take place, and we're going to slide our filaments 10 nanometers at a time. Now, different muscle fibers are going to have different contractile properties. Not every myosin is made the same, and not every muscle fiber is made the same either. Certainly, we've heard of fast and slow twitch fibers. Excellent. That's about all you need to know. And, and they're exactly what they sound like. The twitch would be the contraction. How quickly can they contract? That's, that's directly related to the amount of force they can generate. Now, how quickly they contract, of course, has everything to do with that myosin power stroke. That's how we contract our muscles. When you hear about myosin, you, you normally just hear that, myosin. That's it. But there's not just one type of myosin. Some of them hydrolyze ATP more rapidly than others. And if they do that, that means they contract your sarcomeres more rapidly and thus generate more force. So we can stain for different types of myosin and differentiate different muscle fiber types. That's what we're seeing right here. Some myosin ATPases, that's our little m ATPases, are going to fall apart in alkaline conditions. Others won't. The one that falls apart in alkaline conditions hydrolyzes ADP a lot more rapidly. So the darker the muscle fiber, the higher the amount of this fast myosin ATPase. And you'll notice some muscle fibers don't have any of it. They have a different type of myosin, a slower version. What type of muscle fiber might that be? Slow twitch. Exactly. Yeah, because myosin does the twitch. If you have the fast version of myosin and a whole lot of it, well, you're going to be the fast twitch fibers. Type 2B, the fastest twitch. There's two types of fast twitch. They both generate a lot of force. The faster the twitch, the more force you have, but the more ATP you're spending the more fatigable you become. Others can generate a moderate amount of force for a moderate amount of time. So sprinting, working hard every day, uh, just postural muscles. Those are going to be the slow twitch. They also differ in terms of their metabolism because of the time period that they need to work. Those really fast twitch fibers, they're going to have a lot of glycolytic enzymes. That that's what we're seeing here glycolytic enzymes. The darker they are, the more glycolysis they undergo. In other words, the more anaerobic metabolism they can carry out. So they don't need to have um, a constant supply of oxygen here to generate ATP, not like this slow twitch fiber here. Notice these are the same sets of muscle fibers, so you can see the three different types of stains that they do. On the other hand, <coughs> If we look for markers of aerobic metabolism, so one of those reducing agents that we make in the TCA cycle, an NADH, the slow twitch fiber stains heavily for that, and so does the moderate fast twitch fiber that's a little less fatigable. The highly fatigable type 2B fibers, not a whole lot of NADH because they're not undergoing as much aerobic metabolism. They have fewer mitochondria. So they're not generating as much ATP, and they're burning through it quickly because they contract very quickly due to that fast myosin that they have. So we have a few different muscle fiber types, and you can see they're kind of scattered throughout the muscle. They're not segregated in different parts. 
they're scattered throughout so we can get kind of uniform contractions regardless of the amount of force we're generating, whether it's a little and we're using our type one or a lot and we're using actually all of them. The, the muscle will contract uniformly because these different fibers are scattered throughout. Now you'll notice that they're different sizes, so their their relative abundance in the cell, I'm sorry, their relative abundance in the muscle isn't always uniform. You can change the, the amount of fast twitch versus slow twitch fibers uh, based on use. And that's what we're seeing here. A lot of the early work on movement was done in cats. Uh, this is one of those early works. They used a nerve stimulator to control uh, muscle activity. So they could generate very robust stimulation to see maximum force generation. And here's before they did any of their uh, training, we'll call it. This is the amount of force on the Y over time. If you're going to generate more force, it's going to happen soon. It's going to be these fast twitch fibers. So here's the amount of force that cat was generating with the nerve stimulator. Then they left it on for 73 days, very low intensity. So low, low stimulus here, just like twitches of the muscle. Then when they delivered their robust stimulation, after that 73 days of training, notice the difference. What do you think happened? Turn into not as fast switch? Yeah, those, those atrophied. They weren't getting used as much, so they're going to shrink. Their relative abundance in the muscle goes down. What took its place? Yeah, exactly. Use it or lose it. What they were using was predominantly these with that low intensity stimulation. And this should make good sense to you. If you're training for a marathon, you go run. You do low intensity training so that you get your less fatigable muscle fibers to grow in size. If you want to sprint, you don't do that. You do weight training, high resistance. You want to use these fibers here. And if you want them, you have to use them. So these can change. Those different types of muscle fibers are going to be controlled by different sized motor neurons. And they're going to create different types of motor units. And a motor unit is just that motor neuron and all the muscle fibers that it innervates. So there's always one motor neuron, and then there's some variable number of muscle fibers. It depends on the motor unit. They come in different sizes. They also come in different fiber types. The type S motor units, slow, or not type 1 fibers. Also smaller motor neurons, slightly smaller cell bodies. The importance of that should be obvious, and if it's not, we got it on the next slide. These are for postural movements. Keeping upright all day, you don't want to fatigue and slump over or fall to the ground. So just remaining upright doesn't need a lot of force, but you do want that to work for you all day. So these, predominantly slow twitch fibers there, generate a low amount of force, but it's consistent over time. Time is here, force is here. Fast, but fatigue resistant, and then fast, fatigable motor units. We're working our way up in the muscle fibers that we innervate, but also in the size of the motor neuron that controls them. Slightly larger motor neurons as we increase the force generated in our motor units, but we're decreasing their ability to work over time. And this goes back to the uh, metabolic properties of the muscle fibers from two slides ago. Fatigue resistant, moderate amount of force, is fatigued, but not quite as much as the fast fatigable which will generate the most force, but they will tire off the most rapidly. The order in which we recruit these motor units has to do with the size of those motor neurons there, what we call the size principle. Because we're using the smaller motor neurons to control the weaker motor units, those type S fibers, we can generate a low amount of force initially, and as we continue to stimulate, movement in that muscle, we're going to recruit gradually the larger motor neurons and thus the more powerful motor units. Depending on the amount of input here, very weak input from the upper motor neurons to stronger input, we're generating greater amount of force. But notice we're never jumping from zero to 100. There's a smooth increase because first we're recruiting S, 
FR, FF. And that's because of Ohm's law here. These smaller neurons have higher resistance. So they generate larger potentials from their synaptic currents. They will hit threshold before these larger neurons, lower resistance. We don't get a potential buildup because that charge is free to flow within the cell. And this allows us to smoothly move, no jerky movements. First the weak components, then as needed we recruit the stronger muscle fibers. Now we don't want to use those unless we need to because well, they use a lot of glycolysis so they don't have a whole lot of ATP generative uh, ability and they burn through it rapidly because they have that fast myosin. So we want to only bring in the strong ones as needed. Anything that can be fulfilled by the type S, let them do it. Once activated, those motor neurons are going to cause muscle contraction. Uh, and this will be reliable because of the neuromuscular junction. We get reliable, strong postsynaptic currents because the neuromuscular junction is one hell of a synapse. Uh, this is very different from what we see in the central nervous system where we have a bunch of weak synapses that all have to work together and they vote should we excite this neuron. There's no voting at this point. All that voting took place in the central nervous system. Out in the periphery, once the decision is made to move, we should move. Muscles don't think and we don't let them. We produce very strong synapses on them. Here's our neuromuscular junctions. Hey, there's a muscle spindle. I wonder if that will come up later. Right now, let's think about those neuromuscular junctions. Let's slice through one and see what it looks like. Why is it so special? Here's our nerve terminal. So here's the, the presynaptic component of the motor axon. Here's that neuromuscular junction right here. And if we zoom in, it's a beautiful thing. At the presynaptic side, we have multiple active zones. At the postsynaptic site, we have these invaginations, postjunctional folds that contain nicotinic acetylcholine receptors all along them. And they're there to trap acetylcholine so it doesn't just diffuse away. So they hold the neurotransmitter in place. There's a bunch of neurotransmitter release because we have a bunch of active sites. We get robust depolarization because of this. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? It just takes your breath away. Yeah, I know. Is great. It's a very strong synapse. And so when we stimulate that motor neuron, we are going to cause muscle contraction. No ifs, ands, or buts, unless we have some toxins floating around. But let's assume we don't. Those postsynaptic currents are going to cause action potentials in the muscle cell. And that's what we can see here. Now you'll notice the time scale is pretty long. We're in the seconds time scale. So they all kind of blend together. But you'll notice there's some downward deviation when we have strong input, our baseline, we never return to it because we're providing so much excitatory input, and that's where we see our bursts, action potentials. So that strong input here, here we are again down in, down in B, <coughs> this tells the story. There's an inverse relationship between input and muscle length, and that's because of an increase in intracellular calcium. That's what this blue plot is showing us. F over F is just showing you a change in fluorescence. We have a little uh, fluorescent molecule that tells us when calcium is there. It turns green when the, the muscle has an increase in calcium. And anyway, I want you to notice that those increases in calcium coincide with decreases in muscle cell length. You can plot it here, see a nice correlation between your calcium and the postsynaptic current. Those correlate. And your muscle cell length decreases as we have an increase in calcium. That should make sense. Calcium is around. It's going to bind to troponin and move tropomyosin out of the way and allow active myosin interactions. That's what the nerve cell is doing. It's doing that via nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. These are still nonspecific cation channels. They're going to allow sodium and calcium to flow in. Potassium will leave, but that's all right. We're still reversing around zero. That's more than enough to activate these voltage-gated calcium channels on the muscle cell. So when we have a little acetylcholine release, we depolarize, calcium comes in, acts on these reanidine receptors on the sarcoplasmic reticulum. They do exactly what they did in lecture six. We have calcium-induced calcium release. 
And now we have a whole bunch of calcium floating around in the muscle cell. Calcium moves tropomyosin out of the way via troponin. Active myosin interact and our sarcomere shortens. And that's it. Now we don't want this just to happen where we have our neuromuscular junctions. We want this to happen throughout the cell and as luck would have it, that happens. We have these transverse tubules located all throughout our muscles so that charge can be spread out. Because on those transverse tubules, we have voltage-gated ion channels, sodium and calcium. So once we hit threshold here at our neuromuscular junction, we spread that action potential all throughout the muscle fiber so that it contracts uniformly because it fires an action potential and generates widespread depolarization, leading to an influx of calcium, efflux from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which allows actin-myosin interactions. Then we spend our ATP, shorten our sarcomeres, and we can flex. Do we have any questions on this? All righty, I got a few. Go through these and we'll move on to the next part. Okay, so black is actin and blue is myosin here. That bottom one is blue too. Keep that in mind. All right, walk us through it. Okay, so when uh, myosin has ADP, it's actually going to be since it's holding two things like you talked about, <laughs> uh, it can't attach to the actin. So when it does like pull to the actin, the ADP has to release, which uh, bends it forward. And then once you have um, ATP come into play, you know that it has to straighten because it can only, only hold one thing at a time. So then that straightens out. Sorry. Which way are we pulling actin, left or right, in this drawing? And where do we pull? Um, left. Okay, cool. So then this should just be cocked over a little bit. Okay. Flex. Right. When all else fails, just flex. <laughs> okay, pretty good. Pretty good. Just imagine that third drawing has the myosin pulled over a bit, so we actually did pull actin. But one thing at a time, right? Yes. ATP or actin, not never both. Okay, cool. Good. I think that's pretty good. Um, so then, what does that do to the size of my sarcomere? Fantastic, it shortens, right? We're pulling on the ends, the whole muscle shortens. Okay, how about the size principle? Uh, McKinsey. So the size principle is basically um, the idea of type S fibers being recruited first before type FR and type FF. Okay. Why does that happen? <clears throat> so that happens because of like Ohm's law essentially. So S fibers are smaller, which gives them a higher resistance. What's smaller? Is it the muscle fiber or the motor neuron so Sorry, you yeah, have the motor neuron okay, innervating. Great is smaller, um, which gives that motor neuron a higher resistance. Okay. And so because it has a higher resistance, then it needs less of a current to basically like make the same amount of change as the other types that are larger. Okay, great. So we have an upper motor neuron here delivers some sort of excitatory current down here that current is going to produce a larger potential in the smaller neurons. Right. And those smaller neurons have to innervate the weaker fibers. Mm -hmm. So we get um, a lower force generation at first and we work our way up. Right. So yeah, if you wanted to use your FR and FF fibers, then you would only do that if you didn't have enough as slow and you needed like a higher frequency of action potentials. Right. Yeah. So we're kind of low frequency, that's just going to be slow. Higher frequency of upper motor neuron activity, we spit out more glutamate, we generate more excitatory currents, we can actually hit threshold in these low resistance larger neurons, and now we get them all. Make sense? Good. If it doesn't, ask McKinsey. All right. Neuromuscular junction. 
Sydney. What's that look like? Can you do some sort of interpretive dance or just describe it for us? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so presynaptic specializations cause acetylcholine release, um, and then that leads to motor neurons barring trains of action potentials due to predatory inner neurons and spinal pattern generators. And then that leads to release of acetylcholine, which stimulates muscle contraction. Okay, that's where we're at. Great, right. we're, we're releasing acetylcholine to cause muscle contraction. So we're at the neuromuscular junction, mm -hmm. which is exactly what it sounds like. You're getting ahead of me with that spinal cord circuitry. Oh. It's great stuff, and I love it, but let's not talk about that right now. Let's talk about here, the junction between our neuron and our muscle. Mm -hmm. Why is this such a strong synapse? Because motor neurons branch extensively. Okay, great. All right, so we have a, a greater number of presynaptic sites. That helps. So uh, a greater number of places where we're releasing acetylcholine. Excellent. Anything else? Uh, the active sites. Okay. Okay, sure. What about them? They provide sufficient polarization to like the cell. True. And I, I like the wording. What else? stands out that's so different here than in, in those other synapses that we've drawn and seen. And let's focus not up here at the neuron, but how does the muscle specialize? The negative receptors. Okay. What about them? They will them. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> and they're right there at the surface. Yes. So we have to somehow increase our surface area. How do we do that? Okay. Well, how do we do it whenever we age? <laughs> we increase our surface area. We get wrinkles. Our brain does it too. We have all those wrinkles on our brain. Any wrinkles here? Sure. Yeah. What's this thing? After the junction. <laughs> Wrinkle. <laughs> True. <laughs> True. Oh, yeah. Post junction. Fantastic. <laughs> yes. So at the postsynaptic site in our neuromuscular junction, we have these invaginations. And they're doing a couple of things. They're increasing surface area, so we have uh, additional nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. That's fantastic. What else are they doing for us? And don't be afraid to let the slide work for you. Trapping very good, very good. So we're, we're holding that neurotransmitter there at the synapse. If it's not at the synapse, well, it's not going to bump into nicotinic acetylcholine receptors now, is it? So we have a large synapse, lots of active cells, giant postsynaptic site filled with, filled with neurotransmitter receptors, and we have opportunities to trap it. We create little pools to build up that acetylcholine. Because we don't want to vote. <coughs> We want to see robust calcium influx so we can get a change in muscle length. We're out there in the peripheral nervous system. We're not thinking anymore. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, Stephanie, Snodgrass that is. How are we spreading that depolarization throughout the muscle fiber? Great, right, what is that? Um, so basically... What's the T mean? Anyone? Transverse. Transverse. Okay, so these are going to move, be moving uh, sort of perpendicular or so to the muscle fiber, so they're going to spread throughout it. And how do they help spread that depolarization? They have lots of sodium and calcium, so once we get the polarized, Okay, what's the gating of these uh, ion channels? Okay, fantastic. Great. And that helps the, the muscle then generate an action potential. So the whole muscle fiber is going to depolarize, increase intracellular calcium, and contract. Anything you want to review on that? Did you have a question, Dan? Nope. We got to it. Can you just repeat what you said? What did you say? Uh, so the transverse tubules, they have the voltage gain sodium and potassium, or both sodium and calcium channels. So once one gets activated or depolarized, then it allows them all to be 
Fantastic. So the depolarization spreads. Okay. Then we'll move ahead. Uh, we'll talk about some of the sensory components of the muscle and then relate those back to our motor components as well. Um, for the most part, when we're talking about sensation in the body, it's all about stretch receptors. Because a lot of what we're feeling is just pressure. So we're going to have mechanically gated ion channels that are going to allow our, our nerve cells to be excited. And we'll get to that in the, the third part of it. But it's the same thing in the muscles. We can sense stretch because when we pull on those sensory uh, afferents, it physically pulls open ion channels. We're going to put stretch receptors in different sites on the muscle to sense different things, whether it be muscle length, muscle tension, but it's the same idea. And when we know the position of our muscles and, and joints, then we can have some idea of our body position. So this is how we create proprioception. We're going to relay that to the cerebellum and to the cortex to help generate some mental image of body position. And you can figure all that out. If you know the length of every muscle in your body, you can reconstruct it. And we do that daily. The way that we're sensing muscle length stretch in the tendons, well, we just put a sensory neuron in there. You want to tell how, how stretched your muscle is? Well, wrap a sensory afferent around a part of the muscle. We don't wrap it around the uh, muscle fibers that are contracting to generate force. We put it in specialized structures called muscle spindles. We saw those earlier. They're really small, and they're scattered all throughout the muscles to sense how much stretch is there. What's the muscle length? Now, these things also have um, muscle fibers flanking them so we can control what the muscle spindle thinks the muscle length is. And that's actually very important for carrying out movements. More on that in a bit. But the muscle spindle is that sensory component within the muscle. Little tiny sensory stretch receptors. That's what they are. The other sensory organ that we need to think about is the Golgi tendon organ. So those are not within the muscle, they're within the tendons. So here our sensory afferent is going to be intermixed with these collagen fibers so that whenever we have tension on the muscle, regardless of its length, when we're pulling on that tendon, that's going to stimulate stretch receptors in this afferent. So one senses muscle length or the deviation from our desired muscle length, more accurately, that'd be our spindle afferents, and then the Golgi tendon afferents, those are going to sense muscle tension. You can have tension on your muscle at different lengths, so they don't always send the same types of information. The spindle afferents uh, come in two types. One which is um, rapid adapting, meaning that it, it only responds initially. So that's there to sense changes in muscle length. Not the static muscle length. That's conveyed by these type two afferents. And they're in slightly different positions in the muscle spindle, so they get different names. Annual spiral, because it wraps around, and the other one kind of splays out, I guess, like a flower. So type 1A, changes in length. Type 2, actual muscle length, regardless of whether it's changing or not. These are going to provide feedback to lower motor neurons to help create reflexes. The Golgi tendon organ, is a type 1B. These are going to adapt more slowly, so they'll respond initially and then slow down over time. Rather than exciting uh, the, the lower motor neuron that innervates that muscle, these are going to inhibit that lower motor neuron. Because if we have an increase in muscle tension, well, we're running the risk of damaging either that connective tissue or the muscle itself. So we need to stop trying to contract that muscle and allow it to relax to relieve that tension. So this is another reflex. Have you ever seen anybody uh, collapse whenever they're trying to, to lift something very heavy? Sometimes that happens. That's what's going on here. There's too much tension on their tendons. So the Golgi tendon organ is going to have a lot of pressure stimulating the type 1B afferents, and they inhibit the motor neuron that's causing muscle contraction. Muscle tone drops, and the weightlifter drops. 
Here we can see that rapid adaptation. On the bottom, we're just putting different amounts of tension on the muscle. So we're pulling on the muscle. That's all they're doing. Pull it a little, pull it a lot. What you can see here is that the um, excitation of those 1A afferents is a lot more robust at the initial portion, and then it slowly decreases its firing rate over time. It's a lot more responsive to that initial change in muscle length, as opposed to type 2, which is going to be a uh, more steady state. So here it is in cartoon format. Here we're pulling on the muscle, we're stretching it, and then it's going to contract over here to shorten. When we're stretching, there's this increase, far greater increase during the stretching phase because of that adaptation during the shortening, far greater decrease. Again, we're responding to changes. Type 2, it's firing. It's firing more rapidly whenever we're shorter, and it's back. Notice that it doesn't respond as much to change. And that's because of the adaptation in it. So this allows us to tell what's the length of the muscle, and is it changing? Those two together are going to tell us that. The Golgi tendon organ, on the other hand, is going to tell us about tension, not length. So when we passively stretch a muscle, we're of course going to put tension on that tendon. We see an increase in our 1B fiber firing. <clears throat> Whenever that muscle then contracts, we're putting additional tension on that tendon, and we can see an increase in firing rate. Notice it's not related to muscle length, it's related to tension at the tendon. This is going to provide feedback onto our motor neurons. You can't just consider one in isolation because these always work together to help generate spinal reflexes, to help keep muscles under control. Depending on the type of muscle fiber that we're talking about, it's going to be a different type of motor neuron that, again, differ in size. So our size principle is going to come back into play here. The big muscle fibers that you're going to see in any muscle will be extrafusal. These actually generate the force. And the little tiny interfusal fibers you're not going to see, those are hidden in the muscle spindle. They flank that sensory portion. So when they contract, they pull on the muscle spindle and increase tension, giving the illusion of an increase in muscle length, even though it's actually contracting. So two different types of motor neurons innervating different types of muscle fibers, and they have different functions. The extrafusal fibers are there to generate force. The intrafusal fibers are there to trick the muscle spindle to make sure that it doesn't get unloaded. Because when we contract our muscle, well, we're contracting our spindles too. We're going to affect the activity of those spindle afferents. So the first thing we do in any movement is recruit our gamma lower motor neurons because they're smaller, Size principle is still in play here. That's going to provide a little bit of excitatory uh, feedback via those 1A afferents as we're increasing muscle tone, and then that will help provide stimulation to the alpha lower motor neurons. Let's have a look here. So the gamma motor neurons are a little bit smaller. Here we can see the cell body. That dark, or that dark spot is the nucleus where they don't have choline acetyl transferase. That's the red stuff here. These are cholinergic neurons, so they should have the enzyme to make acetylcholine, and they do. Here's your alpha motor neuron. Notice the difference in cell body size. This is why the size principle works. There are uh, gross differences in the uh, surface area when you slice through them of the cell bodies, and that has everything to do with their excitability. Gamma motor neurons tend to be a lot smaller than our alpha motor neurons, much bigger. Because of that, the gamma is recruited first. So here's our circuit. Here's the sensory component, the green and the blue being 1A and 2. So they're going to sense muscle length and provide feedback to our lower motor neurons. We have alpha to actually create a change in muscle length and gamma to trick the spindle. You'll notice these interfusal fibers are flanking the spindle sensory component right there. So when they contract, they pull on it and stretch it. But when these extrafusal fibers contract, they compress it and shorten it. So they need to work together so that we don't generate some sort of a, uh, a spinal reflex. Here's what that would look like if they did. So in the first part, it's just passive stretch of the muscle. That passive stretch is going to lead to an activation of the alpha motor neuron so that we get contraction. There's your stretch reflex right there. 
you stretch the muscle, maybe you tap on a tendon, maybe you just pull on it if you're in the lab. When you pull on it, that stretches your spindle. That stimulates the spindle afferent, which then excites the alpha motor neuron to cause muscle contraction. So if we stretch spindles, we contract. If we contract spindles, we relax. And that's what would happen if we only had alpha motor neurons. If the extrafusal fibers contract, well, the spindle is going to shorten in length. The excitatory input from our spindle afferent is going to decrease. We're actually going to get inhibitory input from the antagonistic muscle. And what happens is a decrease in that alpha motor neuron activity. So when we stimulate movement, if we don't also trick our spindle, it's going to unload and inhibit that alpha motor neuron. So you'll get contraction followed by relaxation. On the other hand, if you have gamma motor neurons, which we all do, and you recruit those first, what you're going to do is start to stretch that spindle. Those interfusal fibers right here are going to contract, and when they contract, we stretch the spindle. That's going to provide excitatory feedback to this alpha motor neuron to facilitate its recruitment. Of course, the upper motor neuron is recruiting it as well. So first we get gamma, then alpha. When that alpha motor neuron fires, the muscle contracts. While it's contracting, so are these interfusal fibers, so that we have no overt change in spindle length. We don't generate a stretch reflex, and we can actually contract our muscles. As we'll find out later on in this unit, spinal reflexes are always trying to keep our muscles at the same length that they are right now. The only way that we can evade these spinal reflexes is through our gamma lower motor neurons. We have to trick the sensory component of this spinal reflex so that it doesn't sense any change in muscle length even though there is. This muscle is shorter here, but the spindle is the exact same size because those interfusal fibers are also shorter. Mind blowing, right? Any questions besides what? <laughs> And we'll go over this a couple times. She'll draw it out. Everything will be cool. All right. Then let's uh, go through these. All right. <laughs> Types 1A, 1B, and 2. What in the world are those? Not Kaylee, but Callie. <laughs> so muscle spindles are scattered throughout the muscles, and that is type 1A. It is rapid adapting and it detects change in length. Um, type 2 is also scattered throughout muscles and it's not adapting and it detects static length. And those are excited, um, they excite interfading alpha or motor neurons. Great. And then Golgi tendon organ is at myotendinous junctions and that's type 1B. It's slowly adapting and it detects muscle tension and it um, inhibits the interfading alpha or motor neurons. Fantastic. Jessica, let's talk about alpha and gamma motor neurons. Okay, so alpha lower motor neurons innovate extra fusel fibers and generate force during contraction, and the gamma lower motor neurons innovate intra fusel fibers and control tension in that muscle. Excellent. Do we all get why that matters? No. <laughs> Fair answer. <laughs> And once we go over stretch uh, reflexes, it'll be a, yeah. that makes a whole lot of sense. Let's see if we can just introduce it now quickly. We're going to consider what would happen if we only had alpha lower motor neurons. Only extra of fibers. Here's what we're going to do. we got two muscles. We're going to rest and we're going to kick. Rest, kick. Yes. In order to kick, we have to shorten our agonist muscle and we allow the antagonistic muscle to lengthen. Yes? Excellent. So let's think about spindle length over time when we're resting and then when we kick in our agonist and antagonist muscle. So if we only had alpha and we contract our muscle, what happens to spindle length? Here we'll say this is baseline and then we kick. What happens? Spindle shortened, exactly. Our muscle is shortened. We should get a decrease. In the agonist. How about the antagonist? 
What's going to happen there? Exactly, we stress the muscle. We have a change in spindle length. We're going to have a change in spindle afferent activity. When this happens, when we stretch our antagonist, that's going to activate 1A afferents. What are those going to do to the lower motor neuron innervating this antagonistic muscle? Yeah, they're going to excite it. So this right here is going to stimulate that 1A, and that'll excite the motor neuron that causes this, but we're going to cause contraction, but we don't want that. We wanted this thing to lengthen. Yeah. Hmm. That's too bad. <laughs> well, I guess we can't move. Or maybe we just do something else. Now let's think about when we have gamma motor neurons. What's going to happen to spindle length? Let's think about the agonist muscle. So we're at rest, and then we kick. And before we kick, we're recruiting our gamma lower motor neurons. What do they do to spindle length? Let's draw our spindle here. And yeah, think of it as uh, like a, a piece of, um, you, ever, you ever eat those real shitty strawberry candies? They got like the, the center and the green on the side. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Or a peppermint, those suck too. But the ones that have uh, twists on the side and you pull it, what happens? Okay, that's what you want to think about here. All right? Think about candy. So here's our, our spindle, here's our intrafusal fibers. When these contract, what happens to the length of this sensory portion? It gets pulled. So we're going to lengthen our spindle. At the same time, we're contracting the muscle. So what happens to the spindle length overall? Not much. You might get you know, a little blip here and there, but we'll pretend it's perfect. No change. When we're exciting our agonist, we're also inhibiting our antagonist. So whenever the tone from those gamma motor neurons in the antagonist muscle decrease, and they're not pulling on the candy, what happens to the length of the spindle afferent? We're not pulling it anymore. Don't overcomplicate it. What happens? Exactly. It's going to shorten in length because these intrafusal fibers are going to lengthen. And when they lengthen, that's going to push this center together and it's going to shorten. But at the same time, we're lengthening our muscle. So what we get is no net change. So we're not going to stimulate stretch reflexes. We're not going to have the spinal cord come in and cancel all this out. We'll review a stretch reflex later on. Hopefully this will make a bit more sense. We'll look at the circuitry there, but that's what's going on. Gamma motor neurons set the desired length, and they do so by pulling on that piece of shitty candy. <laughs> no one wants to eat it. No one wants to think about gamma lower motor neurons, but you should, because without them, you can't change your desired muscle length, and you're just gonna activate spinal reflexes. Okay, let's look a little more at the sensory component and we're going to focus more on skin here, but I do want you to keep in mind this is the exact same thing that's going on in the muscles, in the Golgi tendon organs, it's stretch receptors. That's what it's all about with the exception of Merkel's discs and pain. But normal old tactile sensation, that's just stretch. We sense stretch by actually sensing stretch. It's just that simple. Not many things are, so enjoy it while it lasts. The sensory neurons that innervate our, our body are going to have different size receptive fields, kind of like um, motor neurons have different size motor units. Some innervate a larger number of muscle fibers. The same thing is true here. Some will innervate a larger number of sensory receptors and occupy thus a larger portion of the skin. We can detect these with two-point discrimination. I'm sure you've done this before. If you haven't, you take two needles and you separate them by different distances and you poke. And you see when does it feel like two instead of just one. Depending on the receptive field size of those sensory neurons, that's going to determine how far apart do we have to spread until we hit the receptive field of two different neurons. 
if our receptive field is this big and we put two points on it, we can't distinguish that from one. We're just stimulating one neuron. So the density of innervation is related to this two-point discrimination, the receptive field size. And certain areas of the body that we tend to have more refined feeling in, that we do more stuff with, like our hands, our mouths, those are going to have a much smaller receptive field size. That's what we're looking at here, that two-point discrimination. When the bars aren't as long, smaller receptive fields, more fine sensation. So we can feel around in the dark and tell what, what we're touching. We can tell where the button is on the laser pointer. So they're going to have different receptive field sizes. They're going to have different degrees of adaptation. This is exactly what it was before. That's just how quickly do you change the frequency of action potentials after you're stimulated. Not every neuron is just going to fire a burst forever. Oftentimes they adapt, and some adapt slowly, some adapt very rapidly. Where when you apply some pressure and remove it, you get strong stimulation in both. This one maintained, so it adapted more slowly. And this one, well, it stopped eventually. Some afferents are going to rapidly adapt and only respond to changes. That has everything to do, of course, with the ion channels in them. In case you're curious, they're calcium gated potassium channels. If you're not curious, it's magic. Move on. Um, the sensory uh, organs that are innervated by the, I guess we'll say dendrites of the somatosensory neurons are going to vary in terms of where they're located, whether they're rapid or slow adapting afferents. And that's going to determine what they're telling us. Notice that the rapid adapting afferents are only going to respond to sort of high frequency information, like vibrations or movement. That's what they're there to sense. Just your normal everyday constant pressure to know, okay, my feet are on the ground, Someone is keeping their finger on my shoulder. There you go. So you're, you're using some slow adapting afferents to sense that hopefully gentle deformation. <laughs> and then we're going to recruit some nociceptive fibers there. Uh, the, the normal stretch on your skin, tell if you're holding something, uh, kind of body position, that's related to that too. We're going to stretch our skin when we're moving around. That's going to be sensed, of course, by slow adapting afferents. And they have different receptors for them. You can put this in your notes and look this up later. But they're going to tell different types of pressure, but they're all going to use basically the same mechanism here. We're going to physically pull open ion channels. So here's a little cartoon showing you the location of these uh, different sensory afferents. Sinian, Rafini corpuscle, there's a Meisner up here. There's this Merkel disc down here. That one's a little different because those don't have stretch receptors. They seem to spit out glutamate. Not totally clear on that one. But when pressure is placed on them, they spit out some kind of neurotransmitter. It's most likely glutamate. Everything else, though, operates by this. When you have some pressure on your skin, that puts pressure on the sensory organ there and the nerve fiber embedded in it. When you place pressure on that nerve fiber, you're really putting pressure on its membrane. When you apply that pressure, that stretches the membrane and physically pulls open ion channels. So now their ion core is open, and they can depolarize and excite that sensory afferent. That's it. It's just that simple. Everything is mechanically gated to some degree. You can rub your eyes and see colors. But your skin is incredibly sensitive to changes in pressure because they link these ion channels to the cytoskeleton. So it kind of amplifies that stretch a bit. So they're very sensitive to changes in pressure. As a result, apply a little pressure pull open an ion channel, excite your afferent. Some of them will respond initially, allowing them to sense high frequency input, and others are going to respond for a persistent uh, period of time. We also have afferents wrapping around our hair follicles. Um, same thing. When the hair follicle moves, this is going to pull open stretch receptors there. Um, these generally have a slightly larger receptive field, allowing them to be more sensitive because they have a, a greater number of inputs, so it's easier to excite them. Um, and this allows things like the, the whiskers of the mouse there to be very sensitive, so they can use that to help 
detect uh, their, their world. But it's the same idea. Um, they also use slightly different afferents. They use A delta rather than A beta, so they're a little smaller. They're still myelinated, but they're smaller. That should tell you that they're also more excitable as a result. So you can feel the wind gently moving in your hair because it's innervated by these smaller and thus more excitable A delta fibers. It's the size principle all over again. Ohm's law, my god, when is it going to go away? I don't know. Not here. Still here. Um, pain is going to be conveyed along different types of fibers. So is tactile sensation, as we just saw. There's A beta and A delta. We're going to take it one step further with pain and include these non-myelinated, much smaller C fibers. So pain is going to provide a much more long-lived stimulus, so you can learn from it. Pain should be instructive. Don't do that again. The reason that it's instructive is multifold. Part of it has to do with prolonged input to continue to gently remind your nervous system that you've done something painful. You've damaged your body. So maybe, you know, don't do that again. There's an emotional response, but that's up here. We're not there yet. We're still out here in this class. We're still out there in the periphery. But even in the periphery, pain is going to remind us over and over again that we've done something wrong. Now that something wrong uh, is going to be sensed not by stretch receptors in this case. Uh, it's going to be sensed by ion channels. These ion channels are sensitive to acid. Uh, they're also going to be sensitive to intracellular components like Brady Cannon and ATP. Those will bind to G protein coupled receptors and produce a long lived increase in the excitability of these uh, trip V1 or acid sensing ion channels. So when we have damage, when cells break open and they spit their intracellular components outside, the nearby pain sensing fibers are going to pick that up. That's going to translate to an increase in their excitability. It's GQ coupled. That's going to excite them. We should remember that. They're now going to be more excitable because we have GQ signaling activated. So they're going to detect. that acid that's, that's spat out, it could be intense heat, it could be something like capsaicin, the spicy uh, component of, of peppers, that's pain too. Um, so we're not detecting stretch here, we're detecting chemical, whether it's heat or acid, because we will have uh, a drop in pH whenever we have tissue damage, because usually there'll be some inflammation involved There'll be a little bit of swelling. This creates a pool where we have low uh, uh, gas exchange because we've pooled fluid. So it's more difficult to exchange oxygen, carbon dioxide. Our bicarbonate buffer is going to drop pH. That's going to stimulate nociceptive fibers. Uh, so does uh, working out uh, intensely. That's going to also stimulate nociceptive fibers. There's some burn. Uh, could be early, probably due to uh, glycolysis, you can actually detect a change in pH. Here it is. For those of you curious, you can read about it here. But the main point uh, here is that after exercise, yeah, we're going to get an increase in glucose because we've increased blood supply uh, to, the, to the muscle. But we also have an accompanying uh, increase in the lactate that we're producing and a drop in pH. This is more acidic. Our nociceptive fibers have acid sensing ion channels. When it's more acidic, more nociceptive signaling, pain. You feel the burn. You'll feel the burn in the long run because of inflammation and prostaglandins that are going to increase um, blood supply and then cause that swelling that will drop the pH. And those prostaglandins will also um, increase the conductance in our pain sensing ion channels. They also have receptors that are going to affect the sensitivity of pain sensing ion channels. And then, of course, we still have our, our axon reflex. This is still true. We covered this last semester. Uh, but for completeness sake, we'll cover it again. Uh, whenever we have tissue damage and we stimulate our C fibers, they are uh, not only going to relay pain into the spinal cord and then eventually on up into the uh, brain there along the anterolateral pathway or the spinal thalamic tract. They're going to act out there in the periphery. They can release uh, 
uh, neurotransmitters like substance P, this calcitonin gene-related peptide, both of those are going to bind to gene protein coupled receptors on immune cells and stimulate the release of histamine. Histamine is excitatory. It's excitatory in the central nervous system, it's excitatory in the peripheral nervous system as well. That histamine is going to stimulate C fibers. So when we have active inflammation going on, there's a couple things that are happening. The, the additional immune cells that are there are going to stimulate our nociceptive fibers that will release histamine. There will be a back and forth between them as the axon reflex. Because when we stimulate this axon, it stimulates immune cell that then stimulate it. So it's a positive feedback loop to make that damaged area a lot more sensitive to pain. That's the hyperalgesia there. So this way, when you have a boo-boo, you don't touch that area. It needs to heal. If you've, if you've uh, broken a bone in your foot, well, don't walk on that. It's going to hurt. We're going to amplify that pain peripherally, but also centrally, too. If you want to go back and review that, that's all still true as well. And then the inflammation that occurs to heal that damage, whether it's a, a splinter or something else there, we're going to recruit blood supply so we can get immune cells to the area. Along with the immune cells, well, we're going to have some fluid accumulating, and that fluid accumulation creates a pool of low diffusivity, so we're not exchanging gases as readily. pH drops, pain-sensing fibers detect that drop in pH, and you feel a little painful. There's also direct communication via those prostaglandins as well. So there's a lot going on that makes pain very long-lived. Part of it has to do with that small axon diameter and a lack of myelin, that's true. Part of it also has to do with the fact that it creates a positive feedback loop to prolong excitation of these painful fibers. So that when we have damage, we avoid stimulating that area and further damaging it. Do we have any questions? Mostly the stress receptors, unless something goes wrong. Then it's acid sensing ion channels. All right, let's review these and call it a class. Let's talk about the last two. Okay. Can I do the last one? Go ahead, tell us about the last one. Let's start at the bottom. All right, so you have acid sensing ion channels, which obviously sense differences in pH, and then you have the TR, PV. Um, have channels which are not specific cation, which also respond to heat and changes in pH. Yeah. So muscles burn after exercise because you're creating local, local cellular damage, which causes inflammation, which stimulates those nociceptive afferents, thereby causing the pain sensation. Excellent. As well as the metabolites from exercise also lower the pH and cause the same thing. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're exercising, what type of muscle fibers do you think you're using? Depends on What's your intensity like? <laughs> Moderate. Which one makes you sore? High intensity. Well, I mean, any of them good, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. Let's suppose that you're uh, you're you're lifting. Which muscle fibers do you think you're using? Starts out slow, and then depending on the weight, goes up. To okay, great. Yeah. So you're going to eventually recruit those fast twitch fibers. Tell me about their metabolism. They uh, are very fatigable and they don't have as many mitochondria, which don't break down the components as well, which allows them to accumulate. Okay, great, yeah, yeah. So a lot more glycolysis. We're gonna be dropping the pH as a result. All right. That makes sense. I'm a little worried that it makes sense. That shouldn't make sense, but that's not so bad. Okay, how about non-painful? Uh, Stimulation. Stephanie Smith. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, how do we sense when someone taps us on the shoulder? What's what's going on? Um, well, that's a mechanical stimulation. So the stretch receptors are like somehow in communication with the nerve fiber. And Pressure on the nerve fibers, like membrane, causes 
the ion channel to open as long as you know, depolarization will let you know that something's happening. Great. We put pressure on the nerve that physically pulls open ion channels. So what's the relationship that we should see then in terms of the number of ion channels that we've opened and the amount of pressure that we're placing? Um, linearly okay, yeah, something like that, right? It, it should be a positive relationship of some kind. A very blurred one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, now it's clear. <laughs> now we all understand. If we open more ion channels, what do we expect to have happen in terms of the um, change in membrane potential? Yes, exactly. It's going to be a more rapid depolarization, more robust depolarization. So what happens to the frequency of action potentials that we're generating in these? Fantastic, exactly. So we generate um, a field potential, we call it. It's going to increase and hold the neuron, hopefully above threshold. So let's say here's threshold. And so if our now our new set point is above threshold, well, we're going to fire action potentials. Maybe not constantly. Maybe we adapt. Why do we adapt? If you don't care, magic. But it's not. It's not. Every one of these action potentials increases the amount of calcium over time. Here's our calcium increase. And so that increases our potassium permeability as well. But you can call it magic, and it's pretty magical. All right. Any questions? Okay. Well, thank you for your attention. I'll see you next week.